Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Robinson and today at the end, you know, this is the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup and today we've got Jaden who's going to talk about ERC 655551. And um, so Jaden, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and tell us, uh, and then maybe present your slides and tell us all about ERC 6551. Sounds like a plan. Let me know when y'all can see my screen here. I'll pull up some slides. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Well, very nice to, to be here. Thank you all for having me. Uh, excited to chat with you guys a little bit about ERC6551 and some of the things we're working on. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jaden. I work with a company called Future Primitive, where we are a on-chain product studio. We do a lot of weird experiments in Web3. We build products, we build uh, um, NFT collections, we build tooling, we, we do a lot of stuff. And recently, we've spent a lot of time building experimental NFTs. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about what does an NFT look like when it's more than just an asset that sits in, sits in your wallet and when it can do more than that. Um, so we've done some weird experiments like what if you had two NFTs that could talk to each other? What would that look like? Uh, we've done some experiments with burn mechanics. Benny, uh, one of our founders, was on the founding team of CryptoKitties and you know later went on to, to launch Cheese, Witter, Cheese Wizards and NBA Top Shot and worked at Dapper building a lot of these kind of new novel NFT experiences that brought a lot of people to the Web3 uh, ecosystem. And so we, we've got a lot of experience playing with NFTs and ERC6551 came from that. Uh, we've been working on some projects where we wanted to uh, build out some equipable features into an NFT project. And we went down all these different rabbit holes of using all sorts of different tools to build that. And we hit on this idea that really resonated with us. Um, and this idea was token bound accounts. We were like, what if we just gave every single NFT out there its own wallet? What if NFTs could own wallets, just like you or I could own a wallet? Uh, that would mean that every single NFT out there would be able to own other NFTs or own ETH or own ERC-20s. When you give an NFT a wallet, you let it own any asset uh, that exists on chain, just out of the box. It also means that you give NFTs the ability to take actions on chain. So if you know I, as a user that has a wallet, can go and mint another NFT, my NFT can now go and do that same action as itself, as its own self-contained identity. Or my NFT could go swap coins on Uniswap or whatever action you wanted. Uh, and third, it means that the NFT has its own identity on chain, its own wallet address, and its own transaction history. It records on chain a history of all the actions that NFT has ever taken. And so as we were building out this project, we kind of stumbled on this idea of what if we just gave every NFT a wallet? And for us, it solved a lot of uh, a lot of our use case. We were building out equipables. We we're like, oh, what if the NFT just owned its own clothing? And then you could equip the clothing onto and off of the NFT. Um, it just seemed like a really good mental model. And so we shared it with some other folks, friends who are building in, in, in experimental NFTs as well. And they're like, wow, this is really cool. This solves a lot of our problems. Uh, can we use it? And so that's when we were like, hmm, there's more to this than just some toy NFT projects we've been working on. This is something that has the potential to be um, to be really powerful as a standard because this, when every NFT has this capability, not just some NFTs, it gets really powerful. So that's what 6551 is in a nutshell. It gives every single NFT on Ethereum from the very first NFT ever created to the NFT project you launch next week. Every NFT already has a wallet address, reserved, unique, and assigned to that NFT. And 6551 is what makes that happen. So uh, I'll do. I'll get a little bit technical in this talk if folks are interested in that. If I'm going too technical at any point, please feel free to have me pull back and I can focus a little bit more on use cases or things like that. But how 6551 works under the hood is, uh, oh, actually, let me just show you a demo. Uh, I'm a visual person. Visual demos are, are uh, you know, uh, easy for me to understand. So let me pop open another tab here and show you what I mean. This is the Genesis CryptoKitty. This is one of the first NFTs out there. Um, you know, CryptoKitties was uh, helped form the ERC721 standard. So this is this CryptoKitty on uh, Uniswap or on OpenSea. If I go to the URL bar and I change the URL to tokenbound.org, which is a Etherscan-like explorer we built for tokenbound accounts, you'll see this CryptoKitty has this wallet address. This wallet address is reserved for this CryptoKitty. It's owned by this CryptoKitty. It's permanently bound to this CryptoKitty. If you know about soulbound tokens, this is kind of like the inverse of a soulbound token. Instead of a token permanently tied to a wallet, it's a wallet permanently tied to a token. And ownership of this wallet goes wherever the token goes. 
So if you if the owner of this CryptoKitty sells the CryptoKitty, the new owner will have ownership over this wallet and ownership over all the assets inside of it. And so you can see this CryptoKitty owns a, a Coinbase Shield uh, Azura NFT that it has collected. And so this NFT is able to own any assets, even if that other asset has no concept of being owned by an NFT. Uh, a couple of other things you can do with this. This is the collection that we originally had the idea with. It's called Sapiens. We wanted to build an NFT collection where each character could collect clothing and equip those clothing onto and off of it. And so you can see this little Sapien has its own wallet address and owns these different assets on Ethereum. So giving an NFT a wallet lets NFTs own anything on chain. So here's how it works under the hood. Right now, we're all used to NFTs existing in smart contracts, right? There's lots of NFT smart contracts out there, and I can own a token with a specific ID, right? In my case, you know, I own Sapiens number zero. Uh, that's my NFT. Uh, you know, for this ERC-721 contract number B, uh, there could be a token 456, and someone owns that NFT. What 6551 does is it proposes a registry, a single contract that gives every NFT a smart contract address. Uh, and the way it does that is by deploying these smart contract addresses using the create two op code. The create two op code lets you deploy contracts to predetermined addresses, to deterministic addresses using uh, a salt. And so what 6551 does is it derives that uh, salt from the token contract address and token ID of the NFT among some other uh, metadata. So that means that every NFT has at least one account, but actually has a whole address space of accounts reserved for it. And so this registry both gives you query access to those account addresses so that you can start sending assets to any NFT, even before the smart contract for its wallet is deployed. But it also lets you deploy the addresses at those or deploy the contracts at those addresses, which lets the owner of the NFT then control that wallet. So in this case, token number 456, owns this account C, which has a unique address on Ethereum. Uh, and it owns this account because it owns the token. If it ever transfers the token, the token changes hands. Uh, under the hood, this registry just deploys proxies, it deploys normal EIP 1167 proxies, minimal proxies to implementations that implement a certain minimal interface. Uh, basically, it gives you the ability to uh, own assets, execute transactions, kind of the minimum viable definition of what an account is on Ethereum. By specifying a registry and a very minimal interface for accounts, this is what lets NFTs have wallets out of the gate. It lets every single NFT, everything that's ever implemented the ERC721 interface, to now have its own unique wallet address, its own unique address space, and the ability to own any type of asset and do any type of on-chain action. So I'll dive in a little bit into the code here. This is the interface for the registry. There is, these are the functions you can call on the 6551 registry. You can get the account address, which is the second function here, or you can create an account. There's five pieces of data that go into an account's unique address. The first is that implementation. It's a contract that is uh, that implements the account interface and is what provides the functionality for that token that account. The next three, the chain ID, the token contract, and the token ID uniquely identify a given NFT. Um, so that lets you know which NFT this account is bound to. And the final um, called assaults lets you have multiple accounts for a given NFT implementation combination. Um, and so this registry gives you insight into every single token bound account deployed. And it also lets you deploy those accounts. Every account implements a very small interface. Uh, by, by default, you have to allow the receiving of ETH because being able to own an asset is what makes a smart contract an account. It gives you an interface for executing arbitrary transactions using this token bound account if you are the owner of the token that owns this account. Uh, it gives some read-only functions for returning the token that owns this account, the uh, account that owns that token, uh, and then a, a nonce function, which tracks changes to that account over time. And so as long as the uh, implementation address you pass to the 6551 registry implements this interface, um, then you'll be able to use the created accounts as wallets. You'll be able to use them to interact on chain. So. There's a couple of companies that are building really, really interesting things with this. You, When you give an NFT a wallet, you give it the ability to own assets, do things on chain, uh, do anything that you as a user could do. And so there's an NFT company called Parallel. They've been doing an NFT trading card game for quite a while. And they're working on this game called Colony, which is like a space mining colony simulator where all of the players in the game are actually AI agents running around doing actions. 
And each AI agent is an NFT. The character is represented as an NFT on chain. And every time it runs around and mines some new ore or trades ore for another resource or you know, goes and pays for something at the market, it's using a token bound under token bound account under the hood to do those actions. So that your character NFT that you're playing the game as is actually collecting new resources over time. It's collecting ERC20s, it's collecting NFTs, it's actually creating new NFTs in real time while it's playing the game. So by giving NFTs the ability to own accounts, you let NFTs play games like this as their own character. And if you go through, you play this game a bunch, you collect all of these assets for your character. If you go and then sell your character on a marketplace, all of those assets you've collected go with it. So by playing the game, you're actually increasing the inherent value of the NFT you're playing the game with. Another cool project that's using it is a company called IYK. So they do uh, physical NFTs where you embed chips and pieces of clothing or garments or, or physical objects. And those objects are then permanently tied to an NFT. What this means is all of those physical objects not only are tied to an NFT, but they're also tied to a unique account. So IYK lets people come up to you, tap your hat, sign a signature on their phone using their finger, and then mint that NFT to the token bound account of your hat. So your hat is collecting other people's signatures over time as you're interacting with it. Another really interesting use case people are using it for uh, is being able to support NFTs as users of your protocol. So this Lens announced this at ETHCC that they're planning to support ERC6551 accounts as users on Lens so that your NFT can have its own Lens profile and post as its own identity on this decentralized social media network. It also means that anything represented as a NFT can now own assets and do things. So your lens handle, which is itself an NFT, can now own assets. Um, so there can be things inside of your lens handle within a protocol. Uh, so when every NFT comes with an account, that means protocols can start to adopt this pattern. So adopt this assumption that your users might be NFTs. And the NFTs that you use inside your protocol can actually own things and can actually collect uh, additional assets on chain. So we get a lot of questions about this. Um, we've been building this for a little while. The, the standard has been out for, uh, or the proposal has been out for a few months in, in draft form. And we get a, a couple of common questions over and over again. One of them is, isn't this just, you know, fill in the blank? Isn't this just ERC-998? Didn't we solve this a long time ago? Uh, isn't this just some other standard? Isn't this just some, you know, centralized company that I've heard about before that does something similar? Um, and the answer is kind of, but not quite, right? We didn't invent the idea of NFTs owning assets. That's been around for a long time. Um, you know, the earliest example that, that we know of was um, was a Kitty Hats, where there was an app, uh, it was a Chrome extension early on, where your CryptoKitty could collect hats and could equip the hats on your CryptoKitty. This was back in uh, you know 2018-ish. Um, so, and then there's been lots of things since, like ERC-998 proposed a standard for NFTs owning other NFTs. And NFTs owning ERC20s. There's been a few other standards since. Um, and I talk a little bit about why those are different than ERC6551. But to start with, there were a couple of things that we thought were really important when we were designing this for our own use case. Um, that we think uh, we think 6551 is the only thing that satisfies all of these criteria when it comes to building a solution for NFTs to own assets and take actions on chain. First is if it doesn't work with every single NFT, including existing NFTs where the contracts are immutable then it, you know, it's, it's never going to be as valuable as it could be, right? Part of the problem with earlier standards like ERC-998 was that the NFTs involved in that ownership relationship, they had to both implement the standard. Um, and that means that most NFTs couldn't own things, but some NFTs could. With 6551, every NFT could own things. It's part of the assumption of what makes an NFT now. The second was that not only should, NFT, should every NFT be able to own things, uh, NFTs should be able to hold anything, any kind of token, ETH, ERC-20s, LEM 55s If somebody creates a brand new token standard tomorrow and it's the next big thing, it will just work out of the box with ERC-6551 because ERC-6551 uses the Ethereum account model. So it's just compatible with everything that's compatible with wallets. The third was that there should be any wrapping contracts. So some other solutions um, let you um, kind of wrap an existing NFT and then that wrapped NFT can be owned. Uh, rather than the actual NFT itself being owned by another NFT. Um, and this is this is a, a fine solution, but you lose some of the provenance of that NFT when you wrap it or when you burn it. Uh, so ERC-6551 works without any wrapping of NFTs. NFTs can just own other assets natively. 
Uh, the fourth was that it had to work with existing platforms. Um, you know, if your NFT can own other NFTs, but nobody knows about it, right? OpenSea doesn't know about it. Uh, you know, the, the wallet you're using doesn't know about it. Then it's, it's a little bit, you know, doesn't really own the assets. Uh, but with 6551, because ownership is represented using an account, you can go and look at the contents of an, of an NFT's account on OpenSea. Uh, and it'll work just like any other account because OpenSea supports indexing of account contents. So by using that native Ethereum account model to represent NFTs owning items, you get pretty much instant support with most platforms and a really easy path forward for them to support the standard more deeply. And finally, one of the reasons we felt this was really important to propose the standard was that this should be fully decentralized. There's a lot of solutions out there that let NFTs own other assets, but they're centrally managed. There's a white list of NFTs that can use them, or there's really strict rules about what your NFT can and can't do with it, its account. By specifying a registry in the actual EIP that's deployed to a known address, the whole uh, implementation is a part of this EIP. It means that nobody ever owns it. It's a public good. Anybody can deploy it at the same address across any chains, and it can be a, a trusted source to use rather than relying on somebody's centralized registry to give you access to this. So as far as we know, uh, ERC-6551 is the only solution that fit all of these uh, criteria. Um, so yeah, I can chat a little bit more about some of the other standards if you guys would like to go into the very nitty gritty of them, uh, but otherwise can move on. Uh, another question we've gotten is why put the registry in the EIP? Uh, if you read the EIP, the, the whole registry contract, its entire source code is in there, as well as deployment instructions and a canonical address at which this contract will live on any EVM chain. Um, some folks have asked, why, do, why not just have an interface for registries so that anyone can deploy their own registry and, um, you know, rather than having kind of one place that everyone points to. There's a couple of challenges with that. One, it's a lot of fragmentation for applications wanting to integrate the standard. You then have to go out and discover all of the registries and all of the address namespaces for all of the NFTs and aggregate them and index them, and that, that's tough. The other thing is it means that there's two trusted contracts in the system. You have to trust the registry and you have to trust the implementation in order for you to trust the account contract. Um, because if you if a registry is upgradable or ownable, then somebody could censor counterfactual accounts or something like that. So by turning the registry into a trusted permissionless immutable contract, the only trusted contract in the system is the implementation address that you as an NFT holder choose to use. It also lets you have cross-chain NFT accounts. And Peter, with the, the cross-chain bridge things, I'm sure you'll be uh, have some opinions on this, be interested. But what this allows you to do is it allows your NFT, which exists on a single chain, right? It's, its home is on a single chain. It allows the account for that NFT to potentially exist across multiple chains. So the same wallet address that's assigned to your NFT on mainnet can also be deployed on Polygon or Optimism or any other chain you want to use if the implementation supports cross-chain execution using some kind of bridge or message passing service. And so this allows you to use your NFT on multiple chains without having the asset itself cross over, uh, over chains or over a bridge, which introduces an interesting new model for building NFT utility. But there, there's a lot of benefits from having a single registry that's permissionless, that's deployed at a single address that anybody can deploy and can deploy on any chain. Finally, what are the problems that exist? This, this sounds cool, right? Great, NFTs can own things now. NFTs can do things now. There's this whole world of cool new use cases that you, we can have for NFTs, but what are the problems? Where's the catch? Uh, there's two trade-offs. There's two kind of things that come up when thinking about this. The first is ownership cycles. If an NFT can own other NFTs, that means that an NFT could own an NFT that owns an NFT that owns an NFT. And you've essentially created a, a tree of NFTs, a, a graph of NFTs. But what that means is you could potentially introduce a solution where this NFT owns this NFT, whoops, and this NFT owns this NFT, but this third NFT owns the first NFT. So now all the NFTs own each other in a loop. What happens then? Well, technically, none of the NFTs own each other. Because with token bound accounts, the owner of an NFT has execution permissions on the account. But if the owner of the NFT is caught in this cycle, nobody's able to initiate those transactions. And essentially, this is a burn mechanism. All of the NFTs and all of the assets and all the token bound accounts tied to these NFTs get locked up and burned, which is obviously not great, right? If you're a user innocently transferring your NFTs around, you don't want to introduce the scenario of having an ownership cycle. 
Um, we left it, we didn't specifically try and rule this out in the spec uh, for a specific reason. With the with ERC721, there's this concept of burning an NFT where you can destroy an asset that you own. That's your right as an asset owner to destroy that asset. Um, if we're gonna build a system where NFTs can self-sovereignly do things, you should have a right to burn your token bound account as well. Uh, even if that's a destructive action, probably not what you really want to do, it's still your right if you want to introduce this. So account implementations can mitigate this. It's really easy to mitigate this in a depth of n equals one, but anytime n is greater than one, so if you have three NFTs like this, uh, it becomes more difficult to actually prevent this because the search space on chain is infinite. You can't iterate over it. Um, there are some other solutions we've explored with this. Uh, you know, what if you could have a, a token bound account implementation that if it detects a cycle has been created, allows you to eject the NFT from that cycle and kind of regain access to it. Um, there's, there's some other potential solutions there, but this is one kind of unsolved problem that we've purposely left unsolved. If you want to, people have already built interesting mechanics using this kind of burn mechanism of 6551 uh, and implementations that want to prevent against this, there's a couple of paths forward for them. The other thing is the potential for fraud. So fraud with NFTs is nothing new. We've seen that for, for a long time. And one of the things that is a, a marker of the ability for NFTs to allow fraud on a marketplace is have NFTs having state. So anytime an NFT has state beyond just the token itself, whether that's the ability to claim an airdrop or the ability to change the artwork or the ability to adjust the rarity of the NFT, anytime there's something other than the token itself that represents the value of that NFT, there's the potential for fraud in the marketplace. And we've seen that with projects like uh, Artifacts Crypto Kicks, where there was a shoe and a vial. And if, if you equip the vial on the shoe, it was much more rare. And so what people would do is they would equip the vial on the shoe, they would list it for a really high price on OpenSea. And then before anyone could buy it, they would unequip the vial and then sell just the empty, boring, non-rare shoe, right? The person who bought it thought they were getting this super rare asset. It turned out to get a very boring asset. So anytime you have state in NFTs, you have this potential for fraud on marketplaces because NFT marketplaces aren't built with the concept of NFTs having state in mind. They treat NFTs as these stateless atomic assets that get transferred around. And so 6551 takes stateful NFTs to a whole nother level. Now your NFT has a wallet and potentially multiple wallets. Those wallets own assets. And so very clearly the value of an NFT is tied to something other than just the NFT itself. And so right now, there's not a lot of good paths forward to handle that at the marketplace level because marketplaces are still thinking about NFTs as these static atomic assets. But there's been some really good research for marketplaces even before 6551 on solving the stateful NFT problem. So Seaport has been leading the way on that. They've got this concept of a custom zone in Seaport where you can have custom validation logic on an order that only lets the order go through if certain on-chain conditions are true. And so we're working pretty closely with the OpenSea team to create a custom zone that supports 6551 accounts. So you can, at some point, you'll be able to create an order on OpenSea and say, I only want this order to go through if I get the NFT and all of these uh, assets in the token bound account for that NFT also come with the order. There's some additional edge cases around here because of approvals on assets uh, and the fact that approvals aren't automatically uh, revoked when a token bound account changes hands, when the NFT for a token bound account changes hands. So this is kind of an ongoing area of research for us. If this is not well supported by marketplaces right now, we want to get to a future where marketplaces support this concept of stateful NFTs very, very widely. And one thing that we hope 6551 does is it gives marketplaces a common language to express state for NFTs. Because right now, everybody builds their own airdrop contracts or their own uh, you know, uh, equipable contracts or kind of their own systems for representing NFT state. But 6551 provides a, a more base primitive where every single NFT now has a tool to represent its state in an on-chain way that works with the Ethereum account model. And so hopefully this will provide a common language for state that allows marketplaces that have a deep awareness of state to be built. So what's next? We've got this standard, we're, we're working on it, we're trying to get it through. The obvious next step is we are trying to get this uh, proposal, it's, it's in draft state. We're hoping to get this finalized. So we spent the last couple of months talking about this, getting people's thoughts, getting people's feedback, and we've got a lot of uh, we've gotten a lot of really great feedback so far that's worked its way into the EIP. So there's a couple of changes coming down the pipe. Uh, likely they'll be out this week, and so you'll probably see them if you end up reading the EIP a little bit later after this. There's a couple of changes that we're making that are going to capture a bunch of 
the feedback we've gotten so far. And then hopefully we're going to be able to push for finalization after we've um, gone through this next wave of changes. So there's a couple of changes to the account interface that we've made. Um, if you look at this interface, the receive and the token methods are still there. The owner method is gone. Um, the owner method was originally intended to allow uh, compatibility with contracts or with systems that use EIP-173 ownership checks. So it uses the owner method to check if you are able to execute on behalf of a contract. Um, but it kind of presupposes a single owner. There's some other issues with it as well. Uh, we got a lot of feedback that the existence of an owner method made it kind of unwieldy to use. So we've removed the owner method in favor of an is valid signer method. Um, basically, this is valid signer method will return true if you are the owner of the NFT which owns this account, or if you have delegated permissions to the signer as the owner of that account. Um, we've also replaced the nonce function with a function called state to kind of get away from this concept of nonces as just an auto incrementing value over time and give developers a little bit more freedom to represent the state of their accounts in a way that works well with marketplaces who can introspect the state of an account to prevent fraud. Um, so those are the changes coming to the ERC-651 account. Also, we've kind of got two interfaces now. Instead of just the execute call function living in the ERC-6551 account interface, every ERC-6551 account now has to implement an execution interface. This is an example one that we show in the EIP, but there's a lot of efforts going on right now to potentially standardize what it's like to interact with a smart contract account. And rather than writing a specific interface into this EIP, um, we, we would love to have the ecosystem standardized around you know, some of the common ways to interact with smart contract accounts. And so we provide an example interface that you can use, uh, but we say, as long as you support an execution interface and you signal support for it with EIP-165, you're good to go. So if you're building NFT projects on top of ERC-6551, these things likely won't, enter, uh, won't affect you too, too much as it's mostly just for people who are implementing custom implementations. If you're using an off the shelf one, uh, this won't affect too much, but this will make it really easy for, hopefully this will simplify a lot of the things that uh, developers have been having a hard time with implementing the standard so far uh, and make it easier to, to scale it. So these changes are coming down the pipe, keep an eye out for them. Um, and you know, as always, the goal of this is to give NFTs the ability to do more than just be assets sitting in a wallet, but let them be full on agents on chain. Um, if this seems like an exciting idea to you, we would love to have you contribute. One of the reasons that this uh, it, we, develop this as an EIP rather than just as a product that we released is because we think this is most powerful when everybody has a chance to come and contribute to this pattern and say and kind of shape consensus around how this should be represented, how this should work on chain. So there's been lots of folks who've been building with us, uh, some some uh, logos here, folks from different uh, organizations who've been really helpful. Uh, we've got a developer working group. If you want to chat with developers who are working on ERC-6551 related things, there's a Telegram link there. There's a little over a thousand people in there jamming on ERC-6551 day in and day out. Uh, we would love your contributions. We would love your thoughts. We'd love your feedback. If things suck, if you don't like things, uh, if you want to see things change, or if you just want to build cool things on top of it and share that, we would love any of that feedback. Yeah, we have some docs. So tokenbound.org is the site that is uh, kind of the, the home for all of the ERC-6551 goings on. Uh, it's got, there's some documentation, there's some tooling we built to make it easier to work with the standard. Um, if you, uh, it's kind of like a, a bit higher level than the EIP itself. The EIP is pretty low level, definitely worth a read uh, if you want to understand it better, but the tokenbound.org site is a bit higher level, how you can use it in your applications, how you can use it in your NFT projects, how you can interact with it as a dev developer. So that's ERC-6551. ERC-6551 gives every NFT a wallet and lets NFTs do anything you want to on chain. I see there are some questions. So I would love to take some questions. Yeah, um, feel, feel free yeah. to raise uh, raise hands. I could do, I could run through the chat if that's helpful. Yeah, I, I yeah, so thank you. I'd say go through the chat because there's quite a few questions in chat. Yeah, amazing. So I couldn't quite see it with the, the screen share here, but um, so is ERC-6551 closer to EOAs as wallets or smart contract wallets? That's a great question. So ERC-6551 accounts are smart contract wallets. Every ERC-6551 account is a smart contract wallet. Um, and that's what makes ERC-6551 possible. There's no private keys involved. It's all code running on Ethereum. 
And because you can deploy code at a predetermined address, that's what gives ERC-6551 the ability to give every NFT a wallet. So it's all smart contract wallets. Um, next question, the implementation contract is like account abstraction, which is a smart contract wallet. Yeah, one mental model that is really helpful to think about this is ERC-6551 is account abstraction for NFTs. It gives every NFT an abstract account. And it works really well when you combine it with some of the account abstraction standards, like some of the tooling around ERC-4237, because now 6551 accounts can deploy themselves on the first transaction or can pay for their own gas or can have their gas sponsored. Uh, it works really well with uh, the account abstraction uh, tooling and mental model there. Uh, you mentioned that NFTs can take actions like swap or any other on-chain actions. Who invokes this action? The EOA who owns the NFT or the NFT itself? That's a great question. So the owner of the NFT will invoke any actions on that token by the count. So whether it's a smart contract owner, if you have your NFT in a Gnosis safe, or it's an EOA owner, you have it in a MetaMask, whoever owns the NFT has execution permissions on the token bound account and can take any action they want to. The above answer is the NFT, then how is an NFT evoke a call on its wallet contract? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. So how can an NFT power itself, right? Uh, there always has to be some interaction from an owner because that's the model of NFTs. NFTs are owned objects on chain. So an owner will always be present in that loop, but the owner can delegate permissions to another account. So there could be another account that's running that is taking actions on behalf of an NFT. And this lets the, uh, the owner of account say like, hey, if I, I wanna play a game, but I wanna let the game logic handle the executions on the account for a period of time. You can do that because it's a smart contract account. You can customize the execution model like that. Uh, and then how will signing be done on the transaction? So you can, right now you can execute directly on the contract with the account that owns the token bound account. Uh, so if you own your NFT in a MetaMask wallet, you can connect, you can call from your MetaMask wallet to the token bound account contract, execute the transaction directly. Uh, with things like 4337, you can also sign a message that then gets posted on chain via a bundler. Um, so as long as the owner of the NFT authorizes the action, that call can be passed to the token bound accounts. Uh, what are some of the limitations of ERC-6551? Yeah, so uh, I covered a couple of them um, with the, the ownership cycles and the, the, the frauds. Um, the other thing is it's just really early. Um, it's still in draft, right? We, we haven't, it hasn't been finalized. It's, it's not built into a lot of the applications you use. We've done our best to design it in such a way that it, the out of the box experience with most applications is actually really good. Uh, if you go to, I can give you an example here if you want to uh, share my screen real quick. Y'all can let me know when you see it. So if I go to this, this is my Sapiens contract account, the token about account for my Sapien. If I go to this address on OpenSea, I'll see that it owns a lens handle and because OpenSea hides things often. Oh, I think I might need to connect the wall, one second. This is another cool thing with ERC-6551. Because it's a contract account, uh, because it's an account, you can use Wallet Connect with it. So I'm gonna connect my Sapien to OpenSea, and I'm gonna use OpenSea as my Sapiens token about account. Uh, so I'm gonna hit connect there and give it a second. So I don't know if you can see, but now I'm connected as 5416BCF5, and that's my Sapiens token about account. And so if I go into in here to my, uh, where can I see it? There's like a hidden field somewhere. Ah, here we go, hidden, because OpenSea hides a bunch of NFTs. And I can see all these other NFTs that this account owns, right? So the experience is a little janky, but it does work, right? You can use your token about account out of the box. You can connect it to OpenSea. You can see your assets. You know, I could list this NFT for sale using Wallet Connect. You can use your NFTs token about account on existing dApps, even though OpenSea doesn't know about token about accounts right now. And if you go and look up the token about account of an NFT, you can see its contents because it's just an account. It's just any other wallet. This wallet address owns assets. And that concept of a wallet address owning assets works with every single app on Ethereum. And so at a baseline, you have some compatibility with existing apps and a really easy path forward for dApps to support token bound accounts. Um, so yeah, Peter's right. The EOA owner calls the NFT's wallet contract, checks message.sender uh, is the owner of the NFT and does the action. Yeah, it's essentially just a token gated wallet. 
uh, by it's a token gated wallet with a, a single contract from which they're all deployed. So they all have a common addressing scheme. Uh, is ERC-65.1 wallet able to grant multisig access? Yes, um, because it's just a wallet, a token bound account can totally be a signer on a multisig. You can use a multisig as an NFT. So you can have a multisig that's comprised only of NFT holders. So you can have like five NFTs that collectively control a multisig. If you buy one of the NFTs, you're essentially buying access to the multisig. You can build some really cool interactions when you have this concept of an NFT bound account. Uh, with just existing infrastructure that has no concept of NFTs owning a, a safe. Um, does that mean we're linking a smart contract wallet with the NFT ID using the registry contract? Yes. So when you deploy the smart contract account, you are linking the NFT with that account. Um, if somebody looks at that account on chain, they know which NFT it belongs to, uh, and you can derive the account, the account address from the NFT's information. So there is that link between the NFT and the account when it's deployed. Prior to deployment, when it exists in this counterfactual state, um, there's not as clear of a direction between the two. If you know the details about the token bound account, you can compute the address from the NFT, but you can't go backwards if it's in this counterfactual pre-deployed state. Um, so yes, if it's on-chain and deployed, the, it's a little murkier uh, in the counterfactual. Uh, Owning a state by NFT is indeed cool, but how about this? Instead of having a separate singleton registry, what if there was an improved NFT ERC, which can give a capability to deploy a smart contract wallet uh, within an NFT smart contract, and the NFT smart contract itself can hold the wallet address owned by the NFT? So this is actually a really, really great point. This is the path that almost every other ERC dealing with NFTs owning assets has gone down. And in our opinion, this is the single greatest weakness of these other proposals, is that they require support from the NFT contract itself. That means that developers who want to support these standards have to build custom NFT contracts that support them. And it means that only some NFTs work with those standards. This is the case with ERC-998. Uh, admittedly, they're a little bit murky with the bottom-up, top-down approach they have. This is the case with some of the more recent standards. They all define an extension to ERC-721, which means that developers who want to support this have to opt into this before they deploy their contracts because contracts are immutable. And that ends up meaning that most NFTs don't support these standards, only a small subset do. So it's really difficult for platforms to support these standards that only work with a small subset of NFTs. Very few NFT owners uh, end up adopting these standards because there's very little platform support. And so the, the, what, what seems like a good idea on the surface of extending the ERC-721 standard and having all of this logic baked into the NFT contract itself actually ends up you know, falling a little bit short. It it's, ends up uh, making it difficult for this concept of NFTs owning other items to get adoption. And additionally, um, this works, you know, th this does work if you, you could have a, an NFT contract which deploys wallets. But uh, another failure point we've seen with other ERCs is the ownership model is not tied to wallets. The NFT contract will have these kind of two concepts of ownership. An NFT can either be owned by a wallet or owned by a token ID. And so it kind of like breaks up ownership into multiple different types of ownership and then tracks those owners in different ways in the smart contract. And that gets pretty messy pretty quickly um, because most applications are used to assets being owned by an NFT. And so since 6551 represents asset ownerships using accounts, you get supports out of the box. Lots of applications are aware of this. With some of these other standards that don't represent ownership using an account, uh, you have quite a bit less platform support. And the, the model for ownership is quite different than the Ethereum native ownership model. As EIP6551 is like a account structure for NFTs, are you going to integrate 437 into it? Uh, yes. So uh, the account implementation that we've launched with has 4337 support already. Um, so it works with the entry points. Uh, if you're executing transactions using the token bound site, even though you're not going through the 4337 path yet, you still are interacting with the entry point for nonces. Um, so yes, we are doing a lot of work to make this really well compatible with 4337. Uh, that is true at the smart contract level yet. It's not quite true at the client level yet. Um, have you worked with Ray Chan at Meme Land regarding the captain's NFT? Yes. So the so yes, the Meme Land is planning to use 6551. Uh, we we have chatted with them a little bit. Of, of course, they haven't released details about that, but they they have publicly announced they're planning to use ERC six five five one. Awesome. And ERC three five two five semi NFTs. Uh, and what are the differences? Yes. So uh, I'm not super familiar with ERC three five two five. 
other than um, it being semi-fungible. And so uh, because of the current design of ERC-65501, ERC-3525 tokens uh, won't be able to own token mount accounts because the you know token mount accounts are kind of predicated on this concept of ownership by a single token, which has a single owner. Uh, that is changing a little bit with the, some of the new changes that are coming down the pipe. Um, but it is at the moment, token mount accounts can own ERC-3525 tokens, but token mount accounts can't be owned by ERC-3525 tokens. And I'm not super, super familiar about the, with the standards. Cool. Is there a way to discover different implementations? Um, yes. So there are a couple of implementations at play right now. Um, there's the token bound implementation. If you go to uh, to GitHub token bound slash, con excuse me, slash contracts, that's the implementation we've released. Uh, Gnosis Guild is working on a implementation called Gnosis Mech, uh, which is a, another implementation of ERC-6551. Uh, there are a couple of other projects that are implementing custom implementations just for their project. Um, so the best way to discover implementations right now is to look at events submitted on the contract. The registry emits a new event every time an account is created with an implementation. So you can come up with a list of implementations by watching those events. Uh, we do plan to have a list of uh, commonly used implementations, especially ones that are audited and well-known and quite secure. Uh, but it's still pretty early days. Uh, as far as, as we know, uh, the token bound implementation is the only one seeing a lot of uh, usage on uh, mainnet right now. Uh, and so we're, as that kind of becomes a little bit more, uh, as there are more folks using it, we plan to uh, have a list of well-known implementations and build that into uh, the Token Bound Explorer. Um, that's a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions? I'm happy to answer. Oh, sorry. I think you might be muted there, Peter. I am muted. Yeah. I was going to say it's the good 30 second rule of no one said anything for 30 seconds. So we, <laughs> we must have run out of questions. But um, yeah, look, that was awesome. So thank you very much for your talk. And um, I, I know I now understand how it all works. And, and yeah, I, I, and I, I think it's actually a powerful thing is not NFTs owning other NFTs or anything like that. But you could imagine you could have an account that has the right to do something and being able to sell that right, you know? So otherwise you might have to like say, well, I'm going to give you my private private key to me, you know, for this thing, which is a really dumb way of doing it. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like for instance, at another company I worked at, we had test accounts with test ETH and firing value around and which I just happen to still have access to. And you could imagine that rather than doing that, you could have a, you know, like have a way of um, not having me say directly having that account credential, which would be a much better idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. Like we spend a lot of time talking about ERC6551 as NFTs owning wallets, um, kind of because we come from that NFT world we build a lot of nfts we, we we kind of were really passionate with that but there's kind of a flip side view of that which is you're representing a wallet as an nft um and mm -hmm. that that gives you this like existing infrastructure for transferring wallets for selling wallets for borrowing and lending wallets all mm -hmm. the infrastructure we've built over the last couple of years for handling nft like nft transfers nft infrastructure it all just works with wallets now too so you can have like entire protocols built on top of the concept of buying, selling, trading, wallet access, and keys represented as tokens. Yeah. Uh, Adek Benga, um, you've got your a question. Yeah, I, I've put my question in the chat. I was just thinking, since NFTs go up in value, dependent on the nature of the and the uniqueness of NFT, is there? The possibility also that the wallets also might have their own commercial rate value. So you have uh, this wallet as a particular holding of NFTs. And I'm even just speculating maybe some kind of NFT wallet market in, in the future. Is that is that another extension of possibility I was thinking? Yeah, for sure. I think this is one of the really interesting aspects of 6551 is it, it challenges our kind of current concept of NFT value. 
right? Right now we think of NFT value as kind of siloed to just the asset, right? When I buy this NFT, all I'm getting is the NFT. But even right now, that's not quite true, right? There's other rights, there's other, you know, things associated with that NFT, like the ability to join a Discord group or the ability to claim an airdrop or like there's other things associated with that NFT. And so ERC-6551 definitely affects the value of an NFT because you can kind of think of the value of an NFT as not just the value of the NFT itself, but also the value of all of the contents of the wallets and all of the value like kind of held by that NFT. And so the, it gives individuals, it gives you the NFT holder direct control over the value of your NFT. It lets you put assets into it or take actions that directly increase the value of your NFT, which is kind of backwards from how we think about NFTs right now, right? Where things like rarity and things like value are largely determined by the NFT creator. 6551 kind of flips the script where you as the NFT holder now have the final say over what is valuable about your NFT. Okay. I'm gonna quickly share my screen for a sec. If I can get the right screen, yep. Okay, you should all be able to see some slides. Okay, so the merch store is now open. So if you wanna um, get a cool t-shirt, um, Go to the shop. You can also get to it via YouTube and look at store. We've got a whole heap of talks coming up. Um, so I'm going to give a talk in two weeks time about the smart contract process that we've got at Immutable. How do we go from concept to deployed contract and maintained contract on chain? Um, we've got Philip from LeFi, who's going to talk about um, bridge aggregation and why bridge aggregation is a good idea. We've got Christian, who's going to talk about Forge, and um, Clemens Wan um, from Consensus is going to talk about um, his thoughts on Web3 and AI tools. And um, then on, in uh, mid-September, I'm going to give a um, talk about Passport Wallet, explain um, its security properties, give an example, hopefully, with a live game integration of Passport in a game and um, talk about the immutable platform. So those are some talks coming up. And if you're watching this live, there's a YouTube channel. If you're on YouTube, there's a Slack and also there's the meetup group, which you can join. Anyone can join. It's free. And there's example code. And if you're into formal methods, there's a channel on the Slack and um, meetings are organized semi-regularly. Um, and so that's a quick run through. But look, Jaden, thank you again. That was awesome. And um, yeah, it's um, I'm actually pretty pumped for the 6551 um, ERC. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes to get it finalized. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. This has been an absolute blast. And yeah, we would love all of your thoughts, all of your opinions, all of your feedback on the ERC. There is a, a thread going on on the ETH Magicians thread, so we'd welcome any comments there. Uh, you can also reach out on Telegram. I'm at Jaden Wendell on Telegram. Uh, and there is, uh, I think, in the slides that Peter should have access to afterwards, there is a link to the ERC-6551 working group if you'd like to join. So we would absolutely love and appreciate all the feedback there. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. And see you later, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>